This is a talk that I gave in September at the second annual um, Florida Wildlife Corridor Summit called Corridor Connect. If you don't know me, I'm Dustin Angel. I'm the program director of education. Um, this, this meeting was an interesting one. There was about 500 people, uh, cowboys and scientists, storytellers, legislators, a whole mix of different kinds of folks. And I was asked to give a, a main stage presentation, just kind of like a speech designed to get all those different kinds of groups of people thinking about connecting, uh, children connecting to nature, and to talk about the education programs here, particularly our summer camp. Um, I think it was like this. This is the best day of my life. A 10-year-old proclaimed, looking up at me, smiling. Yeah, it's the best day of my life, too, says, says another kid who didn't want to be, you know, left behind. So they and about dozen, about a dozen other seven to 12 year olds um, had just climbed a tree and jumped off a towering four foot high spot from the tree right there while I cheered them and took pictures of them. The live oak with sturdy limbs and mighty roots offered another generation the chance to find the confidence to defy gravity. And before this, we'd done a swamp buggy tour. Oh, is this? Oh, I paused it in there. There we go. Before this, we'd done a swamp buggy tour. They met some of the Buck Island Ranch ecologists, um, pointed at gators and ditches, listened to meadow larks singing from the tops of fence posts. We stopped in a wooded area. Oh, there they are jumping off. We stopped in a wooded area um, to speak with the barred owl there. And we called. Uh, to Bart Owl, and it called back, and if you don't know how, you ask me, I'll teach you later. Now we're in a flooded field, and ast an astonished student with mud dripping from her gloves. I love this, and I'm the girly girl of my family. She doesn't normally do this kind of thing, but a teacher had encouraged her to come to our camp. Um, our, our ecologist had just taught her how to find dung beetles in cow pastures, so um, her world will never be the same. Let's go rules for field trips and summer camps. If I need your attention, I will clap like this. Um, da da dum, bum, and then you go. Bum, bum, okay. Bum, da da dum, bum. Nice. nice. Uh, at our camp, we've banned the use of three words. Ew, gross, yuck. Okay, so if we're hiking out there and we see dead raccoon with guts out and flies on it, or a big pile of bear poo, we're not gonna say those words. Instead, we're gonna say, cool. We're gonna get a stick and poke at it because we're scientists. So I, um, I'm the program director of education. And this is what Florida Wildlife Corps education sounds like in Archbold's uh, educational outreach activities. It's active, sensorial, social, immersive, often outdoors, and often involving students interacting with our scientists. For our education team, we've got Katie in the back over there and me, and we generally have volunteers and interns. Uh, we role model presence, wonder, playfulness and we facilitate with loving attention and compassion for each of the students people are creatures of story bombarded by sensory information we have to filter it and arrange it we construct meaning by finding the patterns uh, that make sense to us filtered through our values and beliefs and in that way we add to our stories when i'm with students i'm hoping to give them experiences that will make it through their filters. Okay, another lesson here, um, or the first lesson. The first informal law of ecology is, this is for you to answer, everything is, oh, look at it, wow, what a crowd. If you got that wrong, I would have been worried. Um, yes, the sustainability compass, so N-E-S-N-W, this one's a little harder. Does anybody want to take any guesses with N 
would be in the sustainability compass? Yell it out. Confidence. Nature. Very good. Okay. E. Here. No. No. See, this is a this is good. We're doing this. So now you'll know. Okay. Um economy. S. Not science. No. These well, these are the four compass points of sustainability. Social society. And I'll give you the last one. W is well wellness. The idea is that you can't have the sustainability without the environmental, economic, and human social parts of it. So maybe some of that made it through the filters. It's the idea. You've heard that people will protect only what they love. Yes, that's part of what we aim to do in our programs, give students the chance to fall in love with Florida and with science. Yes, but it's not enough. No, not nearly enough. The corridors, rural lands, I would say are underappreciated, undervalued by a lot of people. Um, but on the other hand, Floridians do love wild Florida. It's not that they don't love it. Um, but even with them loving it, we still continue to have loss of habitats, disconnectivity in our corridors. Solutions are difficult. Today, we're all expert consumers, but the problem is that nature is not a product. Nature is heritage and legacy, health, community, that's relationship, bounty, Nature is a mother that takes care of us, but we need to reciprocate. Environmental issues are complex problems, but I want to focus on how I think our education program here helps contribute to this as a solution. It has to do with stories. In Florida, we have an identity and an imagination problem. We have an autobiography problem because the story people tell themselves about themselves and how to live in the world isn't working. We need a new story. If today we ask everybody in Florida to write their biography or their memoirs, how many of those people would include the habitats that were replaced when their neighborhood was built or identify the watershed that they're in or acknowledge the thousands of years of cultural history of the landscape there where, the, where their neighborhood is? Maybe in this group here we've got a little more to do that but most people know um, and let's not forget all of the children who don't have the chance to go to the wild florida you know what part is that going to play as they build their identity so the solution that i think lies in the land it's the it's common ground it brings us together it's also a vessel for and an expression of cultural knowledge memory identity and imagination. So for example, the Seminole tribe of Florida and the Miccosukee tribe of Indians in Florida remember that the Kissimmee River was formed by an ancestor who transformed into a serpent. And that Lake Istapoga, which means people have died here, was once a place of dangerous supernatural power and perhaps still is. For us that are not indigenous to North America, like myself, um, our ancestors had place-based histories too, where mythic truths and experience of the land intertwined, where the boundaries between mind and body, the individual and the group, and the people and the land were blurred. But they left those ideas a long time ago, and far from Florida. So here I am, many of us, their descendants, struggling with how to live sustainability uh, sustainably. Ecology and economy share the same root word, oikos, which means home. I think that we're only partly rooted, partly embedded in place. Therefore, our environment and economy are only partly sustainable, which is another way of saying it's not sustainable. So in Archbold Educational Outreach for school-aged kids, uh, we've taken an, an approach that includes identity, sense of place, 
and connection to nature. And specifically, I'm talking about My Science Future, a multi-part camp activity that involves um, some of the photos that have already popped up on there, hopefully, this one. So in that project, the students look at portraits that I've taken of many of the people in this room right now that I've taken of, of researchers and conservation people at Archbold and throughout this area um, and land managers. They draw themselves as scientists. They get their own portrait shoot with me dressed up as a scientist. Um, and they also, and they also um, get those photos and then write a message to go with them too. And then at the end of camp, they receive a copy of their portrait, a framed copy of their portrait and their writing. So I'm gonna finish up by um, telling you like some snippets from their, their writings. And I recommend listening for various ways that they're incorporating nature and science and conservation into their identity. I feel that animals are my best friends. I really want to be an entomologist. I've always loved being in nature and collecting bugs. I love to dress up as a scientist. I'm holding a deer skull because I hunt these. I hunt these with my dad. I think you should treat nature fairly. You should not pollute nature. I will help any animal that's not feeling well and protect nature and the wildlife it has. I love the earth. I love the sea. I love the fire. I love the air. I love my life. I want to save the animals. Nature is something that lights up your future. I chose to be a land manager because I know what invasive species are doing to the environment, so I want to help. And another student who wants to be a land manager said, because they want to light things on fire. Uh, Stephanie Kuntz's son. Uh, take care of the air, because we need it. I believe that animals should be treated how we want to be treated. We want to be treated with kindness and to be treated fairly. We're all living things. I chose to be a herpetologist because I enjoy going into nature and hearing all of the, the sounds, seeing all of the sights, and smelling all the smells of nature. Um, and finally, the birds and the wings are equal. They represent freedom. Being able to leave your home, being free, being able to see the night sky every day. See, the beauty of nature is everything. The good, the bad, everything. In closing, the Florida Wildlife Corridor movement, I think, is a step towards our new story. And I hope that future generations will remember this as the time that Floridians let their roots become deep and mighty, like the oak. The time that we followed the path of the panther. The time when we could declare, this is the best day of your life. Thank you. I think there's really a question for you, but let's have someone has an inspired question. We're very, very fortunate to have you and your wonderful photos. So who's up next? Thank you. I gotta start moving yeah. right along. Um, microphone. Richard, give me just a moment. I need to move things back around on our screen here. Anyway, the oh, there it is. Well, Richard, I'll let you introduce yourself if that's fine. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, that was uh, is going to be a hard act to follow. That was so um, inspiring, Dustin. Um, I haven't got your talk up yet, so give us a second. Yeah, there it is. Good, good to go. Yeah. Yep, I'm going to mute myself and then you'll be ready to go. Great. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Joyce, and I'm a conservation biologist with the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. 
Today, I'm going to talk about the natural history and conservation status of fireflies at Archbald with some context about firefly conservation in the US overall, and a closer look at two threatened scrub species found um, at Archbald. Um, so a little bit about the Xerxes Society, the organization that I work for. Uh, we protect the, um, the natural world through uh, protecting invertebrates and their habitats. And we have uh, four conservation programs, uh, the Endangered Species uh, Conservation Program, to which I belong, pollinator conservation, pesticide reduction, and community engagement. Um, the butterfly that you see here on the left is the Xerxes blue butterfly, which is the first uh, insect species known to go extinct in the United States due to human causes. Um, and it's both our namesake and um, a reminder of why we do the work that we do. So in a world where insects, especially non-pollinators, don't garner much positive attention, fireflies are charismatic ambassadors for insect conservation. So this photo was taken by Oliver Keller uh, near Gainesville, Florida, and shows the flashing display of Photurus congener, a species also found at Archibald. It's a little bit of a cliche, but magical is the word that people always use to describe a site like this. So um, even though many people think that fireflies are uh, limited to uh, kind of e either east of the Rockies or the eastern US, um, Fireflies are actually found um, all across the um, all across North America. Um, at last count, there are um, 174 uh, described species in in the U.S. And there are flashing species as far west as Arizona, Nevada, and eastern Oregon, much further west than people realize. Um, and the farther west you go, the more they tend to be associated with with moist habitats. The um, Archbald's fireflies are a little bit of a, an exception to this, actually. So um, fireflies love of moisture is largely because of their needs during their larval stage. While people tend to be most captivated by bioluminescent, by the bioluminescent displays of adult fireflies, I often remind folks that most of the time, fireflies look like this. Um, these armored predatory larvae living for months or years in the soil or the leaf litter, um, feeding on gastropods like earthworms, um, sorry, gastropods and earthworms and other soft-bodied animals. So it's important to understand larval natural history in order to address their um, the conservation needs of fireflies. And it's really only been recently that the conservation of status uh, conservation status of fireflies has been looked at in earnest. In uh, 2020, the Firefly Specialist Group of the IUCN Species Survival Commission took on the task of doing extinction risk assessments for firefly species in North America, and they assessed about, um, about 130 species following the IUCN Red List methodology and criteria. Um, key partners in this effort included the Xerxes Society and the New Mexico Biopark Society. So what did those um, assessments uh, find? Uh, first, um, over half of the assessed species were categorized as data deficient, which is not surprising given our lack of data on insects as a group overall. Um, but 14% of those species of uh, the species assessed uh, fell in a threatened category. Um, and if we carry those uh, that proportion over to the data deficient species, that is, if um, the data deficient species are threatened at a similar rate as the ones that did have enough data, up to a third of firefly species uh, could be threatened with, with extinction. We already knew that. Florida was a hotspot for uh, firefly species richness. Um, so it wasn't shocking that Florida also emerged as a hotspot for threatened species. There were five firefly species with threatened red list categories, um, including the two coastal species um, that you see on the left and a shrubby wetland species on the right. The species in the middle is the Florida intertidal firefly, 
Um, and it's a species that the Xerces Society petitioned the Fish and Wildlife Service um, to list um, under the Endangered Species Act uh, about a year ago. And we are still waiting, um, awaiting the 90 day finding for that petition. So um, at Archbald, uh, based on digitized specimen records, there are at least 11 species of Lampyridae, the firefly family. Um, and here you can see um, the flash pattern charts for the three flashing species with the most digitized specimen records. Um, these courtship flash patterns uh, tend to be species specific and are really helpful um, identif identification clues um, when in the field. The bottom species um, is Photurus congener. That's the one, uh, the species that I showed the long exposure uh, photograph of. Um, so um, with, with those uh, kind of broader picture of fireflies at Archbald, I'm now gonna give you a closer look at Archbald's two threatened firefly species. And I'll mention, uh, before I do that, um, all three of those um, most common species were um, categorized as data deficient in the red list assessments. This is the Florida, dark, Florida scrub dark firefly or Lucidota ludicolis. It's a so-called daytime dark firefly in which adults are day active and don't use uh, bioluminescence in their courtship behavior. You'll notice that it has the same orange and black aposematic coloration of many other arthropods in the area, and you could even uh, confuse it with a love bug at, at first glance. The males do have tiny vestigial light organs um, and will produce light in response, a tiny amount of light in response to disturbance, um, but, not, but are not used for uh, courtship communication. So in the spring, like April, May, into the summer a little bit, the males will fly low through the scrub looking for the females, uh, which look like this. They are flightless um, and tucked into the sand. Um, presumably the males are using pheromones to, to find them. So the, the flightless nature of the females um, is a barrier for dispersal and recolonization of areas where the species has been extirpated. Um, which has contributed to the the threat level of vulnerable that this species um, that this species has. Um, it it is a little more more widespread than the next species that I'm going to give you a glance at. So the next species um, is the ant loving scrub firefly, and it has a special connection to Archbald. So if you were to take a walk after nightfall uh, somewhere like Red Hill in April or May, you might come across a pinprick of yellowish green light on the ground. And shining your light on it, uh, you'd see this peculiar pale um, insect with little uh, wing buds, and it usually wouldn't be far from an ant nest, um, such as this uh, Trichomyrmex ant mound. Uh, the males, on the other hand, do have wings, and they're most frequently encountered at uh, black lights or in flight intercept traps. So Pleutomotes nidomai was described in 1948 from a male type specimen collected in April 1945 at Archbald, um, but it wouldn't get much attention for another 50 years when John Savinsky and others did life history studies and documented its association with ant colonies, actually various species with um, different, uh, different taxonomy and kind of ant life history guilds. Um, and excuse me, larvae, adults, and pupae were found um, in in these excavated ant colonies. Um, but it didn't appear that the um, that the larvae were feeding on the ants or their brood. So it was, it's maybe been um, it may be uh, a microclimate that they are seeking out in these ant colonies. But we really we really have no idea. Um, so a sampling effort of scrub arthropods um, done by Mark Darup and uh, James Carroll found that the this species was really relatively rare. Um, they recorded it at just seven additional sites on the Lake Wales Ridge and found fewer than um, fewer than a hundred uh, specimens in many many trap days. Um, because of the the flightless females um, and its distribution that so far has only been documented on the Lake Wales Ridge, 
I'm not surprising given the number of endemic species on the ridge. Um, it was assessed as endangered on the red list. And it's the only uh, firefly species that's currently listed in Florida's um, Wildlife Action Plan. Um, I just like to um, plant the seed that there's still a lot we don't know about these fascinating animals. Um, one natural history mystery uh, kind of relates to their diet. So according to, to Mark, uh, the Lake Wales Ridge and its sandy habitats don't really support populations of the classic uh, firefly prey taxa, so earthworms and gastropods. Um, so what are these larvae eating, um, especially the these Pleotomodes that live inside the ant nests, um, really just walking around at night and looking for glows and gathering more just very basic natural hist history observations could go a long way in um, uh, helping us understand these animals better. Um, another question relates to threats um, and conservation actions. So um, we know that artificial light affects um, some, some fireflies interfering with their courtship behavior, um, but Pleotomodes um, has not been, been studied. Um, I think at Archbold, you also have the amazing opportunity to look at, you know, time since fire and other management uh, activities and it, its effects on uh, the, the presence or absence um, of these fireflies. Um, for Pleotomodes, uh, Nidami in particular, it'd be helpful to, um, to do more sampling beyond Archbald, um, particularly, particularly in, um, in sites that are not um, wholly protected. Um, and then finally, um, it would be really great to get a, a better handle on population densities and population trends. Um, and there's some non-lethal methods that people have started to use in Europe using um, just uh, low-cost low methods, a plastic water bottle and an LED um, to use a more of a targeted sampling method that's still non-lethal and could be combined with um, you know, mark and recapture or, or other methods. Uh, the Xerxes Society has a relatively new project called the Firefly Atlas, um, which compiles occurrence records and survey data for fireflies across the US and Canada with a focus on threatened and data deficient species. Um, you can check it out at fireflyatlas.org. Um, the site provides data sheets, uh, survey protocols, training resources, and the data portal for actually sharing your data. Um, for all of you who are based in Florida, I would love if you participated in the Firefly Atlas and even modest survey efforts could help to inform uh, firefly conservation efforts. Um, if any of you in the audience are Xerces members, I just wanna take a moment to say um, thank you for, for your support. And if, if any of you are interested in becoming a member, you can do so at xerces.org slash donate. And then finally, um, thank you so much to, uh, especially to Joe and to Laura for making this uh, hybrid participation possible. I really appreciate it. And I'd also like to thank Mark Dayrup for sharing his expertise on scrub, scrub invertebrates and for advising Xerxes staff when we visited Archibald in spring 2022. With that, I'll take any questions if there's time. Uh, are there any questions, Richard? Coming up the firefly season, sort of March, April. Uh, also, I think Helen Hammock always has a firefly night if you want to go and enjoy that as well. So there are local firefly opportunities. Yes, yeah, sorry. Here, take, take uh, us. Wait, he can't hear you. Uh, hi, Richard. As we know, this is a wet winter in Florida. So uh, what does it uh, imply for fireflies coming up? So um, the age, uh, the kind of time to maturation varies a little bit by latitude with fireflies. Um, in, more, in more temperate climates, um, it can take two years um, for the larvae to mature to adults. Um, I don't think that the... Um, 
yeah, I'm I'm not sure how well the, how much the like larval lifespan has been studied for species at Archbald. So you may see this may be a great spring, or it's possible that next um, next spring might be the time when you actually see the effects of this winter's wetness. Okay, well, uh, we'll move on to thank you very much and uh, thank you for joining us. So we're going to move on to our next speaker. I'll let you introduce. And, uh... All right, you lose your mic. Is anywhere? Pretty well. Uh, I have a pointer. You have a pointer. Is that the middle? Presenter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it should work. And I just hit uh, can enter to go. Yeah, you can and please left and right on your on your pointer there too. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Elizabeth Gandy, and I uh, I hail from the West Coast, so I'm kind of outside of my normal stomping grounds. Um, uh, I am the assistant curator of preserved collections at Marie Selby Botanical Garden. Um, and I would want to talk to you guys today about a, a small project, but one that we did here um, at the station this past year. And it involved the seed collection of Hypericum edisonia. All right. So um, for those of you who just may not be familiar, um, Selby Botanical Gardens is, uh, of course, like as I said, we're located in, in Sarasota on the West Coast. Um, we're well known for our display of uh, tropical and semi-tropical, subtropical uh, species. We actually are first and foremost a research institution and we specialize in uh, epiphyte research. So a lot of our work gets done in Central and South America where epiphyte diversity is quite high. Um, but we do also uh, do conservation and botanical inventory projects uh, here in Florida. So we think it's very important, of course, to work in our own backyard. So we actually have um, two campuses. Um, our original sort of downtown campus is where we uh, house our living collections, about 12,000 accession plants, almost half of which are of known wild provenance. Um, and of course, our herbarium collection of about 120,000 or so specimens and our liquid preserved collections, um, which we have about 35,000, second largest in the world, who knew? Um, so we house, we house those there. Um, and then we have a second campus uh, about 10 miles south um, called Historic Spanish Point Campus. Um, and that's a kind of a little less manicured area, a little more focused on sort of native uh, or natural habitats um, and native Florida plants. It's well known for the um, archaic uh, shell midden habitats there uh, are in quite good condition and really interesting. It's a nice uh, archaeological interpretation there. So that's us. So this uh, project, the seed collection project um, that we did here at Archibald was part of um, a broader initiative that's called the Florida Plant Rescue. And I'll just call it Flipper from now on. It's easier to say. So the project is administered by the Center for Plant Conservation, which I'll um, go into just a little bit and more in just a moment. So the goal of the initiative is really um, to prevent extinction of Florida's rare and native Florida. And their, their methodology to prevent this extinction is to uh, uh, bank seed in long-term conservation collections. And for plants that are do not have a uh, seed that lends itself to banking, they might be a tissue preservation, like cryopreservation. Um, so it was started here in Florida with a model project, a kind of a, a beta project in 2021. Uh, and it was modeled after the California Plant Rescue Project, uh, which has been going for some years and has been quite successful. And it's, it runs as an annual funding cycle uh, where participants um, uh, propose the species that they would like to work on. And then a certain number um, are funded for each um, participant. And uh, so to date, uh, again, it's been running kind of full uh, since 2022. So it's just a couple of years. We have, about, we have 20 seed collections, uh, including two exceptional species, exceptional species being those that um, resist banking. And these are just uh, an example of a couple of the species that have been worked on. And these are so far the uh, institutional partners here in Florida. Um, you can see they're not necessarily all from Florida, but they are uh, Center for Plant Conservation uh, partner institutions. So um, the Center for Plant Conservation, for any of you who might not be familiar, um, they're based uh, now uh, at the San Diego Zoo um, in California. And they're really a nonprofit that's dedicated to saving plants from extinction. That's really their primary mission. 
Um, and they, their goal is to, um, of course, as a, you uh, apply and, and pay a membership fee to be um, a member of the CPC. Um, and they're, what they kind of bring to you as an institution is kind of that um, really important collaboration that you get with other institutions that are members. Um, and they have some really good uh, data repositories. They have a, an online database that, for example, is specific to the Florida Plant Rescue Project. They also have a database specific to the California Plant Rescue Project, which is really helpful. And they have uh, great funding opportunities, um, online resources like their Rare Plant Academy, which helps to teach best management, management practices for plant conservation, et cetera. They also maintain a national collection, um, which um, has over 2,600 species in it. Um, and it's a national collection in the form of living plants or seed bank or, or uh, tissue uh, preservation as well. And so again, the, the goal being to save those as a hedge against extinction. And there's about, about 75 member institutions and their focus is on uh, North America with an expanding focus, hopefully into the Caribbean and beyond. So um, specific to Selby Gardens work with the Florida Plant Rescue Project in 2023, we work on three species. Uh, one was, is uh, Stemina Minnesota or the Minnesota pawpaw, which is a very narrow endemic, pretty much only Manatee County. So it's very much in our neck of the woods. There is a single plant just across the border in Sarasota County, but I don't really count that as very much Manatee County. Um, it, really, it really likes uh, sand hill and some scrubby flatwood type habitats. Uh, it is a shrub, has a very distinctive sort of falcate or sickle shaped leaf. And it definitely re uh, resists um, seed storage. So that's not going to happen for it. So we did, uh, we partnered with, um, with CRU, which is, of course, the Center for uh, Conservation Research of Endangered Wildlife at Cincinnati Zoo. Um, they were, have worked previously, especially with Mock Tower Gardens, to work on protocols for this genus to do um, in vitro cultivation and cryopreservation. So we work with them to collect uh, immature uh, leaf tissue. And send that, we sent that to them, and we have some little babies growing in tubes, so that was super exciting. So we will continue with that project this spring with um, some additional collection of tissue to try to keep that going and get some more, uh, we could get some more lines in the culture. And we also work with Lyatra savinensis. This, is, uh, this plant has not been ranked by, um, by NatureServe, but uh, it's, an, again, another endemic kind of to the west coast, to the west coast of Florida. So we did work on seed collection of that, and that was from Sarasota County. And then the other was working with Hypericum edisonianum here uh, at the Violet at Arch Bowl. And this was, of course, a seed collection. So I'm sure most of you guys are probably familiar with it, but just in case you're not, um, this is an endemic from Polk to Glades County, uh, also DeSoto and Collier counties. And it is a shrub. It does like to have wet feet. It really likes to be in these uh, seasonal depression marshes depression ponds, also lake edges. We even found them on, you know, on wet roadsides. But the vast majority of the densest populations are in these um, seasonal ponds. It does have reproduct reproduction, both sexual and asexual. And, you know, of course, where it is found, especially here at Archibald, it can be quite dense. Um, it can flower year round and is understood to be self incompatible. The capsules, which you see here, they have about 150 to 200 seeds per capsule, but oftentimes many of them are not completely formed. It can be well over half of the seeds in the capsule not completely formed. Uh, this is a picture of something that I will explain in a minute. It was a very rare occurrence for us to find when we were working here, which is a capsule at the exact right stage to have seed collected in the field. That was one of maybe two <laughs> we found that day. So that's a great picture. You can see it, has, it kind of has a very distinctive greenish yellow color, but that is a stage at which you could kind of squeeze on that capsule and the seed would can just, would just pop out. But that was, again, very, very rare, unfortunately. <clears throat> so, of course, Archibald has a very healthy population. So we knew this from, of course, the literature record, um, things like iNaturalist observation. So there's good documentation of, and of course, element occurrence records through EFNE. Um, so we knew that it had a good uh, population. And so we approached Archibald for permission to scout and collect seed, which they granted. And of course, that problem proper permits, et cetera. So we initially visited on June 12th of this past year, just to kind of scout for presence, you know, what wetlands might have the plant, um, how, how dense was, were the plants in any one spot, what was the phenology looking like? And so again, we found very few capsules at that ideal stage, about two probably, the whole time that we were looking. And that was after stopping at a number of wetlands. Um, so we thought, well, 
we'll try, we'll give it a little bit of time and we'll try again later. So we came back again on August 2nd and we, we found the exact same thing. Um, very, very, very few capsules at the right stage to actually collect the seed. So uh, we decided we would need to bag the capsules, the immature capsules. We're going to hit the right button. So in those, in, those scouting, in those scouting times, we worked on selecting wetland sites that were both um, obviously had the plants and were also accessible because it was obvious we would have to come back to them several times. Um, and so this is kind of the kind of the northern, this, whoops, sorry. Uh, this here is the station headquarters. Um, so you can see this is about, about, a, two, about a two mile range. Um, and so each of these kind of aggregations were different, you know, wetland areas that we identified. And we, end up, we ended up identifying 18 sites that were favorable and accessible. Um, so the Center for Plant Conservation Best Practices would like to see a conservation seed collection be at least 50, about at least 50 maternal lines and at least, least 3,000 seeds. And this was us experiencing that weather that some of you all were talking about. I'm sure all of you who have worked on the, on the property know how wet it can get. Um, and working in places like Pakahatchee Strand, not no stranger to the water, but it was a little bit of a surprise to me how wet it was. Um, so, but you know, the first, you know, I think five visit, four or five visits, we were fine. We'll get to the not fine part in a minute. Um, <laughs> so one of the big questions that we had to answer was um, how many maternal collections could we safely make per wetland? Being a clonal species, it was, it's not as cut and dry as some species as far as what is a maternal line. So, you know, so we had to kind of answer that question and to be perfectly honest, we took somewhat of an arbitrary approach. Um, this is an example of a wetland that's in zone 46, which is just about due west of where we are now. Um, and this is, it was a really large wetland. And so we ended up um, kind of going with something we call a kind of a maternal area. And so we were not sure at all how many seeds we might be able to get from any, any one capsule. So we, we, we bagged, we used, put 25 um, bags and we used these three inch by four inch organza bags and, uh, and bagged, you know, put 25 bags on plants all within you know, a few meters of each other and then tried to separate those by I don't know, 40 to 50 meters at least. Um, and we tried to make that separation um, there, of maybe a group of plants an area where there were no plants and then maybe onto another group of plants. And again, quite somewhat arbitrary we need some a little bit you know deeper work to be able to know that these are truly not uh, not clones of each other, but we did what made sense on the ground. Um, this yellow dot here is a, actually an herbarium collection. Any seed collection needs to have a, an herbarium voucher made with it as well. Um, so this so in this particular wetland we had you know the four different uh, seed collections. So it took us two full days um, to bag uh, all of the site all of the sites. Um, so that was done September 11th and September 15th. So um, sometimes uh, it would just be one capsule. If a couple of capsules were adjacent to each other, then there might be several capsules in a bag. Um, so we returned on October 5th to collect the bags. So that was our last trip. And that was where we got to really experience the weather. Um, so it's quite wet. Um, so again, um, all subsequent trips, we did fine driving around. I pride myself on being a an off-road driver, never been stuck until there. Um, so, um, so we got we were stuck here, and it was going to take about half an hour for uh, Lupe, I believe, uh, to come and rescue us. And so we finished picking up um, the rest of our bags that were uh, down the road. It was right adjacent to the pasture property, uh, was our southernmost area. One of the goals of the seed collection, of course, is to try to get a kind of a, a broad range, right, broad broad cr cross section of the habitat and size of plants, et cetera, um, within the population. So we, we found some areas that weren't necessarily in wetlands and sampled, and took, uh, sampled seeds from there. Um, and so then this was us um, being uh, towed back to the, thank you, being towed back, Ooh, uh, because the water ended up being just too high to even drive around. So, but I understand that our vehicle was salvaged <laughs> and didn't die, <laughs> so that was really good. So, and of course, then came the seed processing. This was, um, you know, quite a process. Um, we did. We were not making. We'll not be making the seeds at at Selby, but we sent half of them to uh, Atlanta Botanical Garden, 
and half to the National Laboratory for Genetic Resources in Fort Collins, Colorado as the backup institution. So, and again, I think I just make sure I, oh, oh sorry. Um, so the, the, the counting was really a challenge. These are, of course, tiny, tiny seeds. Um, this is one millimeter here. Um, there's a beautiful seed. Um, and we first tried to um, estimate counts using area, but the seeds kind of are uh, uh, with a lot of static sticking to the surface and also like to bounce away from each other. So we ended up using volume. This is a one and a half mil microcentrifuge tube here. And this is a uh, thousand seeds. So we ended up with about 21,000 seeds, which is of course way more than we needed. But again, we weren't quite sure what to expect. Um, but then we were able to split those in between the two institutions. Um, the, the collection bags range from 150 seeds to 1,000 seeds. So there's quite a variability in the seeds that were formed, fully formed and, and presumably hopefully viable. Um, and then we also held back a few seeds from some of the, the groupings that had uh, quite a few. And this had been working on a little bit of germ germination. Um, this again with some plates, um, following um, some work done by Abrahamson uh, to use filter paper uh, and on the plates. And then this is a this is a turgid seed here. Um, and we also did some uh, pots in the greenhouse, and we treated half of them with a, a 50 ppm gibberellic acid solution to try to like, break dormancy and see what kind of results we would get with that. And so far with the plates. Nothing. Nothing so far, but then in the greenhouse, we have some babies. Very exciting. So uh, my next step is to hopefully add some heat to the plates. And um, we have some cute little babies going on in the greenhouse, but they are just as tiny as the seeds. Uh, but, but you can see we have uh, the blue here is the gibberellic acid treatment. You can see we have a lot more positive results with that so far. Uh, uh, but I'm not giving up on the plates. I'm going to add my, hot, my, my warming and see if that helps. So again, we'll see if that helps to get some germination because that's, I think, the big difference between the plates and the greenhouse is the temperature. So one thing, one thing also I have to note is we did find some of our bags were actually underwater um, that were on the plants because the water had come up so much just in those couple of weeks. And so that was kind of a lesson learned to make sure that the bags are high enough. And to try to get our work done at Archibald a little bit earlier in the season, <laughs> we don't end up underwater. Um, and so we might try a few more, uh, maybe a little bit different concentrations, maybe a few more variables. Um, so. That's it. So, so thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> Mark, yeah. Oh. This is extremely rare. Oh, really? So, okay. I'm very excited to see that. Interesting. Huh. Well, the anthers were a really fun part of cleaning the seeds. Yeah, lots of those. But we found that the dinner plate method worked really well because the seeds, the anthers would actually statically stick to the plates and the seeds would slide off. So simple, but were effective. Sorry. Okay. And then the center is your palm. Okay. You ready? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Caitlin Weed. I am a field technician attached to the Restoration Ecology Lab here at Archbold with my head PI being Dr. Sarah Fitzpatrick at the W.K. Kellogg Biological Station at Michigan State University. The title of my presentation today is The Effects of Inbreeding and Genetic Rescue on Heat Tolerance in a Widespread Freshwater Fish. So we are currently facing an extinction crisis. Biodiversity loss is increasing. One of the drivers of this is habitat fragmentation which as you can see on the figure here on the left is increasing in areas that have large human populations. This is due to things like highways, interstates, uh, neighborhood structures, things like that. Because of this decreased habitat connectivity, it can lead to inbreeding. Animals are unable to go out and find other mates that are not within their family groups, so they start interbreeding and you end up with an inbred population. These two things come together to create the phenomenon of inbreeding depression, 
which is the decrease in fitness of a population due to the accumulation of deleterious alleles. Again, this is in populations that are isolated, small, and inbred. So one way conservationists have found to combat the effects of inbreeding depression is through genetic rescue, which is the assisted migration in gene flow resulting in demographic recovery and reduction of inbreeding depression. This is all assuming that the population that you're pulling from, where your migrants are coming from, are large and outbred. It's done with the purpose of reducing inbreeding, increasing fitness and genetic diversity of the inbred population, leading to the decreased risk of extinction, larger population size, and it can mask the deleterious inbreeding effects that were being shown. An example right here on our top graph is the mountain pygmy possum from Australia. So their numbers were declining rapidly and the population was becoming very unfit and inbred. But the introduction of two different male migrant groups in two separate years drove the numbers back up, the population grew and they become, became more fit. Another cool thing about genetic rescue is that it can lead to increased genetic vary, or forgive me, increased genetic variation can increase ability to adapt to future challenges. And one of those future challenges that we all know about is climate change. Many organisms are facing that currently. This graph on the bottom here is land and ocean temperature departure from the average in January of 2023 from NOAA. And as you can see, that temperatures across the globe, land and sea are increasing. So one way that organisms can adapt to this challenge is through having a high heat tolerance. I'll come back to that in a moment. So why is genetic rescue not used more often since it sounds so great? In the figure on the left, Fitzpatrick et al. Rilla figured out that genetic rescue in relation to translocations and species survival plans is mentioned very, very few times. And one of the, some of the reasons this could be is due to feasibility. It takes a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort, and a lot of manpower to move organisms across state, across country, and things like that. Also, it's the idea of who to choose. How do you know that you are taking fit individuals? The population you're pulling from, can they give up that genetic material? Are you going to monitor the integration of this migrant into the population? Or are you going to track that they're actually breeding with this population? And are their offspring fit? There's also the fear of breaking up local adaptation. Will the migrants be ill-adapted to the local habitat they're being deposited in? And then will they transfer that ill-adaption to their hybrid offspring? So this brings us to our overall question. Do inbreeding and genetic rescue influence fitness? So to test this, we use the Eastern mosquito fish, because as most of you know, they are a widespread freshwater fish and they are in any body of water they can get to, ditches, lakes, ponds. So they are the opposite of endangered. So that is one of the reasons why we chose them. They are also in a wide range of ecological conditions and their heat tolerance is well recorded, which may give away what our fitness trait we were testing for, which is heat tolerance. We did this through critical thermal maximum here on out denoted as CT max. And we did this, or an overview of what that is, is when you take an organism, you heat them until they're unable to stabilize themselves, they're removed from that heat source, and that temperature at which they were unable to stabilize is recorded as their CT max. I'll go over that further on, but that way you just have a brief idea of what is happening. And to test for inbreeding and genetic rescue, we set up three different lines, control, genetic rescue, inbred, and I will speak on those in a slide or two. The next slide. So this is how we set up our genetic treatments. So in April of 2019, we collected fish from a source pond in the scrub behind Archbold, and they were then split into two groups. The first group being the control fish. They were placed in the paddle tank in the top left-hand corner up there, and they were allowed to go on about their lives. However, we kept them outbred, healthy, in a large population through adding 30 to 50 individuals every six months. The second group became the inbred fish, they went into those tanks in the middle there and they were allowed to just go on about their lives for relatively about four generations. After that, this group was split further into two. So some were left inbred, they were not touched, nothing happened to them, they were just left alone. The other group became genetic rescue. And one of the, the only reason why they're different is the introduction of migrants from Lake Estepoga in September of 2021. This was one male migrant and one female migrant per tank. These tanks were then allowed to go on for an additional two generations or so, meaning that in total, you're looking at six generations of inbreeding if you're looking at the inbreeding tanks. 
Then pregnant females from each line were brought into the lab to give birth to babies in a common garden situation, meaning that these babies were born and raised in, in common garden situation, accounting for temperature, light, food, so we could count for all ecological factors. In this picture right here in our black circles are some of our babies. You can see how little they are. And these little smudges are actually baby brine you're looking at dinner feeding right now. So another question that came up is, does the source population of translocated fish matter for fitness? As you can see here from Emily Jones, she was a previous fish intern. She found that wild caught fish from Estepoga, so these being where our migrants came from, tended to have lower CT max trends than that of the source pond. So this goes back back to the idea of, are your migrants bringing in maladaptation? So we are worried that migrants from the less t tolerant populations could reduce local adaptation. So starting off with our predictions, we have that gene flow, increased gene flow, would lead to decrease in inbreeding depression and an increase in CT maximum, where you can see with your genetic rescue fish being higher than your inbreeding fish. We have an alternative prediction that decreased local adaptation, so your migrants coming in and being maladapted and giving that to their hybrid offspring would lead to a decrease in CT maximum. And our second alternative prediction is that an increase in variation through genetics because of our um, migrants would lead to an increase in CT maximum, where you can see that our genetic rescue fish are even higher than our control group. And to explain these graphs a little bit, on the x-axis, of course, is just your genetic treatments, and your y-axis is CT maximum in degrees of Celsius. We don't have numbers on it right now, but just assume low to high. So this is how we set up our critical thermal maximum. So five fish were randomly selected from the lab. To remind you all, these are fish that were lab-born in the common garden situation. They were placed into the cooler and allowed to acclimate for 10 minutes, at which that point, CT maximum would begin, and we would ramp up the temperature of the water by 0.4 degrees Celsius per minute. The fish were left in the cooler until they were unable to write or stabilize themselves. They were then removed into cold water recovery tanks, and the temperature at which they were removed was recorded. Once they had recovered, they were taken to be measured. Moving on to our statistical analysis, we used a linear mixed effects model, including sex, so of course females, males, juveniles, size, which we standardize by sex because the female tend to be larger than their male counterparts, genetic treatment, so control, genetic rescue, and bread, as well as some random effects. So fish position in the CT max cooler, that's those individual coffee filters that you saw. Batch number, original leprechaun ID, which is the black tanks that the fish were descended from, and mom ID, which was used to account for any maternal effects that were seen. So moving on to our results. Does genetic treatment influence CT max? Genetic treatment does not significantly influence CT max. This is our result graph over here on the left. Oh goodness. There were little bars so you could see the whole thing, but we were having some problems with the jump drive. So it's terribly sorry, everyone. But as you can see, there is a little bit of difference, but you're talking on a scale of one degree Celsius. So it is a small amount of variation overall. However, I wanna draw you back to Emily Jones's results here on the right. As you can see, the difference between the Istapoga fish and the source fish is also on a scale of about two degrees Celsius. So it is just a small amount of variation overall. However, when you zoom in, the trend is in the direction of our first prediction with genetic rescue having a higher CT max trend than that of the inbred. So we also had a smaller question we wanna ask, does sex influence CT max? Come to find out, there is a significant difference of the CT max trend between females to males. Um, and if this was the actual graph, you would see that the juveniles had a much larger bar than all the other ones. And the reason why we think for that is because they had such a smaller sample size. So if there was a larger trend to be seen, we're just not seeing it. So in conclusion, genetic treatment had no significant influence on CT maximum which could be for a couple of different reasons, that local adaptation is still intact. Our migrants were not strong enough to override what the population they were going into was having, or phenotypic plasticity was at play, which is the ability of a genotype to produce different phenotypes, in our case, heat tolerances, when exposed to different environments, either in the lab or outdoors. Sex predicted C-tree max trends, which could mean that male mosquito fish in the future will 
be more susceptible to rising temperatures. However, again, to remind you, this was on a small scale of temperatures. So what's next? So the overall question for the whole NSF funded grant is does genetic rescue impact population's ability to adapt to future environmental stressors? So the research that I just presented on is basically time point zero before the outside tanks, which many of you know about, were started to be heated. So in the future, stay tuned for genomics of all the fish that we've sent in and for Common Garden part two to assess the evolution of genetic treatments in response to heat. So a few people to thank, um, my head PI, Dr. Sarah Fitzpatrick, and then Dr. Betsy Rothamel, all for all of your support and your guidance for the Fitzpatrick Lab and the Archbold staff here who help us keep going. So all of my friends and family who give the love and support that I so desperately need, and, and then to my funding sources for allowing me to be here. Any questions? Caitlin told us up, which is great. So let's take a couple of questions, but could we also, um, is Chris gonna come online? Yeah. yeah. Chris, Chris is pretty much ready, so just speak. There you go. Oh, wait. So the question was, how do we tell the individual fish apart? So the inside lab, it was due to a lot of recording, a lot of tags on the tanks and praying that you didn't move the wrong fish or that you remembered where you put it. I'm sure she's actually asking about our outside blue tanks because we talk about that a lot. We have individually marked every single fish. So if you go out and scoop a fish, I can tell you exactly who it is, what its last weight was, who mom and dad was, things like that. Don't go out and scoop it. Yeah, please don't scoop. scoop my fish, leave them there. Any other quick questions before we move on to Chris? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, oh yes. So the question was: Was there other traits that were looked, fitness traits that were looked at other than CT max and reproduction rates in fish? Um, off the top of my head, I'm unaware that's a lot of times like the really heavy ones that people go with, because especially for ours, we looked at CT maximum traits, but that is a good question. Okay, thank you very much. Of course, Michael. thank you. All right. Okay. Um, so Chris, we're just pulling you up, so I think you're ready to I think you're ready to go. Yep, you're on the screen here, and I'm going to mute us, and we'll, you'll be ready, Chris. And go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you so much. Okay, hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I'm just getting over a cold, so bear with my uh, voice. Um, but my name is Christopher Tarango. I'm a PhD uh, candidate at Cornell, and John Fitzpatrick is my advisor. And um, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about this sort of pattern of extreme variation that I found in, um, in a vocalization. And this talk is pretty media heavy. So if at any point you can't, the videos aren't coming through or the uh, audio recordings aren't coming through well, please, please stop me. Um, okay. So this is a figure from a paper that came out in 2022 showing uh, the geographic distribution of Aphylacoma scrub jays. So that isn't all members of the genus Aphylacoma, it's just the scrub jays, the California, Florida, Island, and Woodhouse's scrub jays. Um, and prior to coming to Florida, where I met most of you, uh, many of you, uh, I spent a lot of time on Santa Cruz Island. It's a hundred square mile island where the um, Island scrub jay, Aphylacoma insularis, lives. And this is a video um, that I'll play in just a moment. But this is the this is the specific behavior that I spent a lot of time studying while I was out there. Um, and I'd like you to pay attention to the body posture uh, as well as the vocalization when I play this. That may sound somewhat familiar for those of you that have spent a lot of time in the scrub with the Florida scrub jays. Okay, and I'm gonna introduce you really quickly to spectrograms. Um, this is a visualization of the sound you just heard. 
and uh, on the uh, y-axis, you have frequency. On the x-axis, you have time in seconds. And you have a sort of third axis of uh, color in which uh, hotter colors, so in this case, yellows and reds, is where the most amplitude, the loudest parts of the sound. Um, so I'll be showing you a lot of these. And so what I found on the island scrub jays is that there wasn't much difference across the island between the two dominant habitat types that are out there, the oak and the pine habitats. That was the oak. And that was the pine. Um, just checking, are those calls coming through OK? OK, yes, good. Um, OK, so yeah, they sound very similar, which yes. isn't. Sorry. <laughs> OK, which isn't surprising. Um, so this is that same paper. Um, this is a, a phylogeny. And uh, island scrub jays, pretty genetically similar. Um, they have a contiguous habitat of the island. And uh, all the calls sound pretty similar to me. Um, Prior to grad school, I lived uh, in the California coast and grew up in Los Angeles. And so the island scrub jays I also found sound, that's the island scrub jay. And then this is the California scrub jay from near Los Angeles where I grew up. So this is a call that, um, that stays relatively stable through time, um, even in these two species that have been um, separate for hundreds of thousands of years. So then I had some shock when I first came to Archbold in 2017 and heard this. So that should be super familiar to those of you who spent a lot of time at Archbold. That's the uh, Lake Wales Ridge hiccup call. And then uh, I was even more shocked when I went just down the road to Jonathan Dickens, Jonathan Dickinson State Park um, and heard this. This is a machine gun type hiccup. And then uh, little did I know just up the road was there was uh, this La Hamaca Ranch. And uh, just last year, I was able to capture this call there. And those three calls represent what was what's been most well documented about uh, Florida scrub jay rattle calls or hiccup calls. Um, yeah. And so the reason I'm surprised by that is that uh, you know, in these two species of island scrub jays and California scrub jays who have been separated um, by an ocean and uh, a lot of genetic distance, uh, they still sound relatively similar. Whereas Florida scrub jays from 20 miles, 60 miles apart, um, in some cases, just a few miles apart can sound drastically different. And so my first step was documenting all of the variation um, but first, I guess there had to be the question of, are these even the same call? And so this is how I Oh, th that is a repeated, uh, they don't sound like that in the wild, but that one is just looped. Uh, that's a female spec specific vocalization. That is the, the hiccup call, the machine gun hiccup uh, at Jonathan Dickinson State Park. Um, and that vocalization is accompanied by that same thing that I showed you in the first video, this body posture, tail flare, bobbing up and down. And each of the, uh, the scrub jays pair their respective hiccups or rattles with uh, these physical behaviors. So in that way, we can consider them homologous. So um, in order to document all of the different calls, I drove all around Florida, um, hiked through hundreds of miles of scrub, um, and collected hiccups from 34 locations. I chose locations based on these genetic units and metapopulations. Um, so I'm going to just walk through 
some of what I found with y'all. Um, and I found a surprising amount of variation. So this is Ocala. This is a really stable population. Most birds in Ocala sounded like this. Okay. And this is in Seminole State Forest. Merritt Island. So hopefully you're picking up on differences in tone and pace. And even some different like clicks and grunt types that have been added. And in this case, an incredibly rapid vocalization. That mute hiccup type again. And for each of these, I'm not picking the, the ones with the most variation. I'm picking representative, as representative as I can of the uh, surrounding area. So the majority of um, birds in the population, if there was a, a significant population, would have sounded like what I'm playing for you. Okay, so hopefully that helps illustrate that there is a lot more going on than I think we had originally suspected in terms of variation in the uh, hiccup calls. There were some locations that I wasn't able to sample, but um, that's because unfortunately, um, as many of you know, we're losing a lot of scrub habitat and um, the populations that are X'd out are so small that they're no longer able to um, seemingly sustain scrub jays. But why is there all this variation? And how is it generated? I think those are the two big questions that I've come away with. Um, this is field notes from Fitz uh, from uh, 1990, where he recited a bird from 1975. Um, that bird had been uh, hatched at Archbold, um, but when he found it, it did not have the typical Archbold hiccup. It had the mute type hiccup. So that's some evidence that these females can learn a novel or like their local habitat or their look. Yeah. If they move, whatever that habitat that they move into, uh, whatever that locale is, they learn the hiccup type potentially um, from that location. And even uh, this bird dispersed after a year. So even later into their lives, they can learn that new call. Um, and I have some evidence of that, which is, at Blue Spring, Blue Spring State Park. So I'm gonna play that one more time, but you can hear the note type switch in the middle. So these are two different note types and one is used um, in the, this is like an Ocala note type and this is a, a Greenway Triangle note type. So two different note types, but then we also have this. which is a, this is actually the same female giving an entirely different call type. Um, this is like the Seminole State Park, uh, Seminole State Forest uh, call type. So this is the same bird giving basically three different call types. Um, and this gives us some evidence of how um, new call types are generated by combining different note types and, um, and just different call types in general. So. Um, so where does all this variation come from and why do we see it more in Florida? I think that my, my best hypothesis right now is that it's coming from um, the fact that Florida has uh, shrunk and expanded over time um, with the uh, glaciation and, and subsequent melting. Um, and so as Florida expands and contracts, it opens up and closes a lot of habitat 
Um, and so as colonization occurs, you have a lot more opportunity for novel vocalization types um, in these small populations. And the areas that were the most stable, like Ocala, where all scrub jays sound the same, um, we have a lot of stability, uh, big populations. It was in the smallest populations, these populations of one or two pairs, where I found the largest uh, variation and the fastest, most extreme variation in the call types. Um, and that's backed up a little bit in, uh, so I, I played you a California scrub jay vocalization from Los Angeles, but this one is from Oregon. And that sounds a lot different. Um, and that's at the top of the range. And then this is from Baja, California. So in this species, we actually do see a lot more variation similar to what we see in Florida, but we're seeing it only on the extreme ends of like thousands of miles of difference, not the, not the uh, short variation that we're seeing in Florida scrub days. Um, and yeah, so this is the Baja California uh, genetic group. So you can see it right down there. Um, and it's quite different than the rest. So um, yeah, I don't know if I have time, but if I do, questions. And thank you for having me. Great timing, Chris. Um, we'll go ahead and have a couple of questions while the next speaker is coming up. Um, uh, uh, online, Laura? Oh, even better. <laughs> okay. Um, so does anyone have any questions for Chris? Well, I had one suggestion while we're waiting, Chris. I wondered that uh, the glaciation... Oh, actually, Mark has a question. It would be much better. Uh, probably not, but I wanted to know the exact function of the call and what kind of evolutionary pressure that could bring. Um, uh, lots of people are nodding their heads. So he, uh, Mark would like to know um, the sort of evolutionary functional, functional aspects of the call and uh, uh, put that in an evolutionary context. Can yeah, you that, abs Chris? yes, absolutely. Um, that's a great question. Um, so uh, the call is used mostly in uh, pair territorial defense. So um, it's used predominantly by territorial females. Um, it is a female sex specific vocalization. And um, yeah, when the male goes and calls and defends, um, the female will add the hiccup uh, in addition. Um, she'll also, two females can hiccup against each other. Um, but it is also used in several other contexts, but that is the predominant thing is in, um, likely in, in establishing or showing to invaders that there is a, um, a, a strong pair bond and a joint defense. Yeah. Did that make sense? Yeah. And, for those, and for those of us who are not, uh, those are always female indicators. So that's always very helpful for us. How are we doing, um, Goldmar and Laura? Okay, bear with us. Um, any other question for Chris while we're waiting? No. I've actually been very curious on those um, sea level rise maps, Chris. Now that we have much better digital elevation models, I think we could do a much more nuanced map and it may show sort of the emergence, some of those more, you know, the sort of kind of um, East Coast uh, higher rise scrub standing up a lot better. So it may actually show that. It's just a suggestion for you. Yeah, I would love to see a better map. I'll, this is 20 years old. So um, yeah, this was just a first uh, pass yeah. at, at explaining the variation. Yeah, okay. thanks. And um, I'm seeing signs of hope here. Uh, Goma, would you like to come up and introduce yourself while Laura pulls this up? Thank you so much. Yeah. Come and tell us who you are, and uh, then we should be ready to go. And I'm going to pin this. You're good to go. Thank you. And it's there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. So that's working out tonight. And then we have a 
laser pointer in the center. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Golmar Gol Mohammadi. I'm an assistant professor in um, University of Florida Range Cattle Research and Education Center. So today uh, I have a talk about numerical modeling uh, for groundwater in um, the area of Buck Island Ranch. Before I start my presentation, I want to acknowledge the work of my PhD student, Sayed Mostafa Yazar and uh, um, Dr. Saha Amartya. Thank you for, I want to thank him for all his support and um, inputs to this research. And also Dr. Barton, Betsy, thank you for all your help and support. So, um, so this is about groundwater, groundwater. So groundwater is important here, especially in Florida, because it's the principal source of fresh water for industry, for agriculture, and also for um, the fresh water in Florida, more than like about like more than half of it comes from groundwater. And besides that, the the water for um, for the drinking, um, it's like almost all of it. It comes from groundwater, so it's very important. And uh, groundwater everywhere, but in Florida, we have one of the oldest and um, largest uh, aquifers under the ground. So and it's very unique. Um, there are some features of Florida and aquifer makes it very unique. Like it's a karstic aquifer, and um, the characteristics, some characteristics of uh, karstic um, aquifers are about like being having sinkholes, underground uh, caves, and also springs that we can see it all around Florida, and especially in the northern part of the Florida, we, we will we observe them so much. These are not the only things make Florida and aquifer very unique. Besides that, the weather of Florida and the, uh, the geographic location, sea water, sea level fluctuation, sandy soil here, these are all together make Florida's groundwater uh, very special. And one of the things about the water here, water resources in Florida, is that uh, groundwater contributes to surface water alone. So it means that if the problems in groundwater, then we, it, it contributes to surface water as well. So they are very much related. Some of the, some of the issues in Florida regarding the groundwater is the so high amount of depletion, so much withdrawal in some areas, the saline related contaminated issues, contamination issues and the nutrient pollution. Those are some of the issues that we see in Florida. So, and um, one of those things that has a high, very high impact um, is the nutrient pollution. So if we talk, when we talk about nitrate concentration, contamination in groundwater, we will see the impact of that on surface water in terms of springs, uh, ecology, risks to, which, which has a risk, great risk to human, uh, human health. And also eutrophication of surface water in the springs, uh, which causes the risk for aquatic and uh, aquatic plants and animals. So there are many ways to which we fight with them. There are many ways just to prevent it. Some of them like if like one way is to have regulatory measures, which we already have it a lot in Florida, one way is to increase them. Another way is to define best management practices, or we call it best management practices in agricultural area and LID in rural area. So the goal of this research was to develop a numerical model, which is one of the advanced type of models, to be able to um, evaluate the, um, first of all, evaluate the groundwater under the ground in Florida, and second of all, second, second to, to see the impact of uh, existing current EMPs 
and alternate PMPs in future on groundwater and see how they can help to mitigate uh, the water quality issues here. So yeah, the numerical model that we have selected called uh, uh, mod flow, and uh, we propose some best management practices. And then in the last step, we are looking at prioritizing those practices and to be able to select which BMP um, responds better in terms of um, reducing the water quality. So. Here in this research, we have looked at the nitrate. Um, there were some reasons behind it, and the most important thing was the nitrate uh, data availability compared to phosphorus. So the first thing that we did was data collection and data processing, which is the first step in any type of modeling project. And then conceptually, we defined our model, the mod flow model for the area study area here in Florida. And then we developed the numerical model, which is kind of mathematically, uh, a mathematical model, which um, which been able, now it's able to simulate the groundwater level and the amount of, and the level of nitrate in groundwater. So the next step was, um, BMP scenarios, we have defined BMP scenarios in the area of um, Buck Island Ranch. So the, for BMP, it's something uh, really local, locally different. So we defined it based on the irrigation management and fertilization management. So, and the next step, so this is our current step. And the next step is to, we are working on a decision-making tool to be able to select the best management practice um, with the highest impact on nitrate reduction. So some of the uh, applications of this, mo of this model is like, I'm sorry. I was trying to have the light. Yeah, it's, yeah, oh, okay. The don't press the back, just press the front. Sure. There's no light, huh? Uh, the center. Center. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Some of the applications of this model is like uh, using it for future climate. Uh, when we have the model set up, which we did, and we have the results, and we have the scenarios, then we can change it based on the future climate, which is like the inputs of the future, such as rainfall, such as uh, temperature, uh, is going to be uh, downscaled and entered to the model, and then we can see what is the impact of future climate on uh, water quality and water quantity. And also the interaction of the surface water and groundwater, especially in some areas close to sea, uh, close to ocean, close to uh, Mexican Gulf, we have like surface water and groundwater interaction. So it's this model gives us the opportunity to look at that uh, so salt water intrusion in, in Florida if we extend the model to other areas. So, and also flood vulnerability and groundwater quality mapping is another opportunity we can, uh, we can look at it later using this model. So the model that we defined um, has two steps. The first one, which is the area of Buck Island, is called a site scale model. First, we developed that model and we, um, we used all the information we gathered in Buck Island Ranch. And then in order to address the uh, adverse uh, boundary condition in this area, we uh, extended the model to the uh, natural uh, boundary levels which is the lakes and the rivers around this area. So this also gives us the, the, the chance to uh, extend the site scale, our site scale model uh, to a larger scale model and uh, when we have new data. So um, the conceptual model was developed and it was the conceptual model means a simplified uh, high level representation of the site. And this model is usually being developed based on the information such as hydrostratigraphy, uh, hydrogeological information, 
uh, and other information that we have from the hydrogeology and hydrology in the area of the study. So um, the next step was the groundwater modeling and we put all the information that we had, such as the topographic data, all the information we got from the, the wells, from the climate, about the initial head inflow and outflow data for the, uh, for the model. And then when we set up the numerical model, then we, based on the information, based on the area uh, and geology of the Buck Island Ranch and the area of between the Lake Estopoga and the Lake Okeechobee, all the uh, model inflow, which is the inflow of the flow which is coming to the model, including the general head boundary, including rivers, recharge, such as, and the recharge was something like rainfall and irrigation return from here. And the model outflow here defined as, again, the head boundary and the well exploitation, uh, evaporation and draining the uh, flow from the model. The model was calibrated and validated. We had two types of model, steady state model and transient model. So the steady state model calibration and validation results are presented here as well as the transient model. These are some, uh, some selected uh, wells that we have selected um, six of them to present here, but basically the model was well calibrated and the results of validation was acceptable, which means that this means that after we calibrate the model and we validate it, it means that that model, if it's acceptable, it means that that model can be uh, represented, representative of the real situation in that area. So we have done it here for Buckeye Land Branch area. And then we, we used another model which called MT3D model for water quality. And in this model, uh, we, we only use nitrate here using uh, the 10 different uh, stations that we had around the Bakoy language. It's, these stations are uh, surface water uh, stations in the ditches um, in, uh, in Buck Island Ranch. But uh, the reason that we used it was that we didn't have any groundwater quality data, water quality data in groundwater. But the thing is this um, one, uh, one thing is like, this is an, uh, this is, uh, an area that we, uh, we can develop, we can, we can work on it and further um, develop our model based on the groundwater uh, data that we can have in future. Another thing is like um, uh, in Florida for the good portion of the year, then we have the surface water stations. It's also um, the level is regarding the groundwater. So groundwater and surface water for certain period of the year are the same body of water. So that's how we use it for uh, water quality nitrate. So we define different scenarios. Actually, we had more than 20 scenarios, but we have, I have selected some of them here just to present the results. The first three scenarios showing the timing of fertilizer. So um, it means that we like the first, second and third scenario is like showing us like it, it just talking about like applying fertilizer during the wet period, during the whole period of the year or dry period. And scenario number three is the amount of fertilizer. And scenario six and seven is like about irrigation. So this is about scenario, the results of scenario one, two, three, compare them together. So it's like basically if we have the fertilizer applied from month one to nine, which is January to September, if we have it only during the dry period or wet period, and the results show that the, um, the, the the application of fertilizer during the wet period is something has the most reduction in nitrate. So, and then about the rate of application, if we reduce the rate of application of fertilizer, when we have more reduction, we are gonna have uh, less nitrate. And that was type of the answer that we were expecting. 
So um, the next thing was that after we just tried all the scenarios, we came to like uh, pasture management. So we thought that okay, let's uh, let's um, let's grade them and see uh, which pasture has higher nitrate and which one has the lower amount of nitrate based on the modeling results. So the blue ones are very low in nitrate and the uh, red ones are very high in nitrate during the simulation period. So scenario seven, eight and nine is about excluding one, one at scenario eight, we excluded the, the pastures which, with, which has highest impact, highest nitri nitrate and, and scenario nine was, was excluding the pastures with the low amount of nitrate. So then we will see if we reduce like the scenario number number eight, which is excluding the pastures, which already has high nitrate, this gives us the best result. So the next, this is the next step. We are working on developing a decision-making tool in order to be able to uh, predict the impact of best management practices and to be able to select which, uh, which practice or which, which BMP, BMP is the best uh, for the pastures or for grazing lands. So, okay, my, uh, thank you very much everyone for your attention. And uh, just I wanna thank to all Buck Island Ranch team um, and um, Greg and also Shafali for their help um, and uh, providing us data. Thank you very much.